If you have your Bibles, join me in Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Last week, as we were there in chapter 18, we were looking at how the children of Israel were three months into their journey. As they're now in the wilderness, they are having to look to God to trust Him for His preparation in their life for what is to come. Jethro had come and had been an encouragement to Moses. God used a man to encourage Moses, to bring glory to his name, and to in turn help Moses see a problem Moses didn't even know he had, and to prepare the system of government for what would be needed years down the road. Now we come to chapter 19. In chapter 19, we see how 18, God uses a man to encourage Moses. Now God himself is going to encourage Moses and the nation. But honestly, if you think about it, when you come to chapter 19, this is kind of a good time in the wilderness for Moses. You see, early on, it was problem after problem after problem. Oh, the Red Sea, we're going to die. Oh, Moses, we have no water, we're going to die. Oh, Moses, no food, we're going to die. Oh, Moses, no water, we're going to die. And the children of Israel just keep on and on and on. And we've had a little time now in which there hasn't been a lot of complaining. We've had encouragement from Jethro. Moses has got his wife and sons with him now. There are some exciting things going on for Moses. And now God begins to speak to him directly. So join me in chapter 19, verse 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai, and he pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain. If nothing else, at this moment, this has got to be an encouraging time for Moses. Moses is at a place to where God is directly speaking to him. And what God has to say to him over the next few verses is such an encouragement. And the response of the nation of Israel is incredibly encouraging. This is a good time. It's important for us to remember that in the wilderness, there can still be joyful times. Oftentimes, when you see things that are going wrong and things that are difficult in life, you can look back on them and you can see those moments of joy, oftentimes even more clearly than when you're going through them. Don't let the wilderness darken the joy that is there. When you look at your life and you see all that's going on. Remember last week we finished up with Moses. Hey, life is still life. There's still going to be all of the aspects of life we have to deal with day in and day out. But when you look at life and you take time to see those moments when things are good, instead of just rolling through them, those moments can have so much more joy. At this time, there's been plenty of bad, but Moses is at a place where God's speaking to him, and it is a joyful time in the midst of the wilderness. I know in my own life that when I'm going through a difficult phase, that there can be great moments, and those great moments sometimes I can miss. I tell people, we've had five children, three of them have spent time in the NICU after they were born. With that, for people, when your child's in the NICU, it can be an extremely stressful time. It can be completely overwhelming. And so, having been through it once before, the second time we went through it, I would tell people in the NICU, when I got to talk to other parents, look, there's an emotional side to this, but please remember, these aren't bad days. These can be wonderful days. In fact, when Kara and I look back now on those wilderness times with our kids in the NICU, the truth is they were some wonderful times. We met some great people and we still tell stories about things that happened that were moments of joy even during those difficult days. And that joy in so many ways almost outweighs the difficulty now. But we had to recognize it and embrace it. Don't miss out on those moments of joy. Let's come back to our passage and continue reading. Moses is there. The Lord calls out to him. The middle part of verse 3. Thus shalt thou say unto the house of Jacob, 
and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. When we look at this, we see that in the midst of the wilderness, in the midst of all difficulty, God's saying, I'm the one who brought you here. I'm the one who's going to bring you out. And there's one more thing. Don't forget, while you're here, if you'll let me, I'll carry you. I will carry you as on eagle's wings. Now, I want you to look at this picture for just a moment. This picture was taken and published by National Geographic's. The picture, there were other pictures in the series from out in California. The photographer caught this crow coming in what appeared to be trying to pick a fight with the bald eagle. And as this crow is trying to pick a fight with the bald eagle, he realizes very quickly he's not going to win this battle. And over the course of just a very brief time, he decides instead, I'm going to hitch a ride. And he settles in on the back of this eagle. And this eagle takes him and he sits there on the back and the eagle continues to fly and he carries this crow. Sometimes in our lives, I think we kind of act like this crow. We go into the wilderness and we see things that we don't want. Things aren't going the way that we like. And so it's almost as if we try to pick a fight with God. God, what are you doing? Why are you allowing this? God, this shouldn't be this way. God, you need to get me out of this. God, God. And we begin to have a little bit of an attitude. And yet if we're wise, we will quickly recognize a crow can't beat an eagle. And the difference between me and God is infinitely greater. So instead of trying to fight against God, what I need to try and do is just rest and allow him to do the work and just let he as an eagle carry me. When God gives this picture here and he says to Moses, you didn't get yourself out of Egypt. I did. The greatest foe this world could offer you. I brought you right out and you didn't have to do a thing. Equally, I will bring you into the promised land. The reality is the wilderness did not compare in difficulty. The wilderness did not compare in opposition to Egypt. If Egypt could be beaten, the wilderness was no problem. But when you're in the wilderness, you can't see. You don't see the past victories well. You don't recognize what God has already done. You get short-sighted. You miss the victories. You hide from the joys. And I said, look, stop trying to get yourself through the wilderness. Let me carry you. I will take and I will strengthen and I will be the source of strength to get you through. But you need to rest in me. So the children of Israel had to learn. God will carry you in the wilderness. He will help you get through this. And in the midst of all of this, we see how God is beginning to give encouragement to not just Moses now, but to the children of Israel. In the wilderness, there's encouragement that can come from people like Jethro. But in the wilderness, there is encouragement that comes that's only from God. God looks at them and says, I will be your source of strength. When you're in difficulty, how reassuring is it to just know that God has promised he will be that source of strength? But God doesn't stop his encouragement there. He continues on. I love this phrase. Ye have seen, this is verse 4 again, what I did unto the Egyptians. I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. I didn't just take you out of one place to put you in another place. I brought you out to bring you to me. You see, one of the definitions of holiness is set apart. To be set apart from the world, Egypt, to be set apart unto God, the promised land. And here the Lord say, 
I'm going to carry you as eagle's wings because I have set you apart. I have taken you out of the world for me. I didn't do this for you. I didn't do this because you just needed a better living condition. I did this to get you closer to me. In Sunday school this past week, we were looking at, at how Jesus works and how he works in the midst of storms. And when we see that in storms, we want out of the storm, God wants to improve his children. Here with the nation of Israel, what you want is out of the wilderness. What I want is you brought to me. He says, look, I'm going to bring you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. Now, the Lord has not given all of these, but he's going to. He said, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. What the Lord does here is he, he gives them a picture. Here's everything in the earth. All of it is mine. Every person, everything, it's mine. I have complete rule. And out of them, what I want is you to be to me a peculiar treasure. In a short time, Israel, you're going to get some information. Some information that's going to be a huge help to you. And if you will keep what I'm telling you, the covenants, the commandments I'm about to give you, you will be to me, out of all the value in the entire earth, you will be a peculiar treasure to me. Now this phrase, peculiar treasure, it has more to do with just, than just wealth. And you even see it in the context. Look, all the earth is mine. All of the wealth of the earth I have. If you have a great deal of financial resources, there is wealth at your disposal. Now, in America, we tend to use our income in a lot of different ways, and we forget because of the expenditures that we put out, the wealth that we really have. And when you go to other parts of the world, you can often see how wealthy we really are. So there is a wealth that we have, and we have savings accounts or safety deposit boxes. We may have a safe in our house. We have avenues in which we take things that are wealth to us and we secure them. God's saying, look, I have security of all the wealth in the world. There is no financial need that I have completely taken care of. But above that wealth, I have a peculiar treasure. I have something to me that is more valuable than money. I have something to me that is essentially priceless. And that that is priceless is you. Now, when you pause to think about what that means, we look at wealthy people in this world and we look at the way that they use their wealth. Recently, the owner of Amazon, who is worth billions and billions of dollars, purchased a home. He purchased the most expensive home in Southern California. I believe it was somewhere north of $165 million. His neighbor put his house up for sale, so he bought that one too because he needed more. Well, we look at that and we see that wealth and the expenditure of that wealth. And we look at it and go, man, I live it. Now, that kind of wealth to him is nothing. That, that expenditure of 165 plus another 10, I think, was the next property over. So $175 million to him is no money. To God, it's even less. And yet in this vast property, it has meaning. But God's saying, all of this wealth, it has no meaning to me. Because my wealth is limitless. It can't be measured. Everything is mine. But what I value is you. In the wilderness, you are God's peculiar treasure. You're what he values. You're what's priceless. You may have a family heirloom. You may have some little piece or trinket from your childhood that the cost of it does not compare to the value of it. 
to God, there is no cost that can sum up your value. You are his peculiar treasure. And in the wilderness and in difficulty, God does not treat us in a sinful manner in which we can tend to treat other people that we value greatly when there's difficulty. You see, in his perfectness, God treats us perfectly even in the wilderness because that's who he values, is us. When you are living in those difficult times, know that God is trying to encourage you, even during this time, because he is trying to bring you to himself. And he has said, I know there's a, a time here in which it's going to be wilderness, but I will carry you because you are what's valuable to me. In the New Testament, the Lord declares, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He's there and you are his treasure. God helps even in the midst of the wilderness. But we learn some other things here. There is associated with Israel at this time a conditional promise. If you will keep these, then you will be. Verse 6, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now that phrase in there, you should be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The priest had a role in the works of God and in the ministry to God. Holy nation is that idea of set apart from to. Even in the wilderness, holiness is important to God. And we see that as it carries out. Moses came and called for the elders and the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded. And the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. For Moses, this has to be a huge moment. Jethro encourages him. God encourages him. And now the people are saying, we'll obey, we'll do it. That has not been their nature. They have been stubborn. They have been referred to as stiff-necked and will be again. But at this moment, the encouragement of the people saying, we'll do whatever God tells us to do. The thrill that has to bring to Moses' heart. In no way am I like Moses, with just the small exception of, as a pastor, I oversee God's people at some level. And it is an encouragement to any pastor's heart to see God's people say, we will do what God tells us to do. And when that occurs, it changes so much. Verse 8, and all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people uh, of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people, sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. And then down in verse 14, And Moses went down from the mount and the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. The Lord says, look, I'm going to give them more information. I'm going to give them more of a message here. But you got to tell them. They need to go sanctify themselves. They need to go cleanse themselves. They need to make sure they are right with me. In the wilderness, holiness is still important to God. We live in a Christian culture in America that has lost holiness. You see it in churches. You see it in a disrespect for the things of God. You see it in culture as a whole, yes. But I'm talking specifically in Christian culture. And we see it in our Christian culture. We have lost the respect for the holiness of God. God is without spot. He is without blemish. And holiness and sanctification is to go and look for those spots and get rid of them. One thing when it comes to cleaning that I don't like doing is cleaning windows. Now, a mirror is bad enough, but I hate washing a window 
because when you wash a window, you never know which side that spot's on, and it keeps switching sides. I don't know how it happens, but you can clean and clean on one side, and you can go to the other, and you can clean and clean and clean, and then you see one on the other, and then you go back, and you clean that one, and then there's another one. You go to the other side, and you clean, and it's just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and it seems like you can never get rid of all the spots, and you finally just kind of give up, and you go away, and you come back, and as soon as you walk to the window, it can be 99% clean, and yet all you see is that spot. Sanctification is the process of getting rid of those spots. And when the Lord says sanctify yourself, it's looking for the spots and getting rid of them. As Christians, we become okay with a certain number of spots. We recognize that we will not be completely sanctified until we get to heaven. But then we become insensitive to our spots. And culture can help bring that sensitivity level down lower and lower and lower. To where instead of being 99%, we get happy being 12%. And we compare, we go, but see, I'm cleaner than they are. The process of sanctification is to clean up our lives toward holiness. And in the wilderness, as you're going through it, holiness is important. When we get in the wilderness, we tend to forget about working on us because we want everything around us to be fixed. But God says, I'm bringing you unto myself. So sanctify, cleanse yourself, and get rid of those spots. Continuing on, verse 15, and he said unto the people, be ready against the third day. Verse 16, and it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down unto Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount. And Moses went up, and the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to the Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds upon the mountain, sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through and come up unto the mountain. So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. Now I see two things in this, and there's a lot that happens in those couple verses. Mountains on fire, there's smoke, there's thundering, there's lightning. People are scared to death because of what's going on. And Moses gets a message from God. And the message is this. Not, hey, here's what I needed you to know. It's you go down and you tell the children of Israel they stay right there. That's their line. You tell the priests, sanctify themselves. You tell Aaron, look, he's going to come up with you, but not right now. And, and there's these guidelines set up. Two things I see. One, in the wilderness, don't forget to spend time with God. Moses goes up, and we'll see more of this ahead, but Moses gets to spend time with God, and the children of Israel come out to hear the message of God. As a pastor, one of the most heartbreaking things is during wilderness times, people stop coming to church. It's the time they need God's message the most and they stop coming and being around godly people godly preaching that can help influence and encourage them don't stop spending time with God when we're in the wilderness we get busy we stop praying we stop reading our Bible don't do it in the wilderness stay with God and then there's a second thing God teaches them that in coming to me here's where the people can come, the priest, Aaron, Moses. And there are guidelines set up by God. And I see in this, when I spend time with God, I need to worship God. 
I, I need to spend that time worshiping him for who he is. And Moses is going to do that. But I have to worship him his way. We have lost this in society. We have this mindset that I can come to God any way. And the reality is, we are a peculiar treasure to God. And God does love us. And God wants us to come to him. But when we come to him, there needs to be a respect and an awe and a worship that is about him and not about us. Most of what Christianity today calls worship is self-promotion. And we need to make sure that when we're spending time with God, it's about his promotion. It is about making him great, not about making us great. The problem in society today is not that we think too lowly of ourselves. It is that we think too lowly of God and way too high of ourselves. So here you are. You're going through the wilderness. God's preparing you. He's trying to pull you unto himself. He says, wow, we're doing it. Let me encourage you. You are priceless to me. And I will carry you through this. But spend time with me. Get to know me during this time. Don't try to do it your way. Come to me and know me, my way. And you will find that my way will work and my way will help. But don't let the wilderness pull you away from me. Let it draw you closer to me. We can grow, go through anything, and we can grow in the wilderness. Tonight, as we pray, do remember to continue to pray for the Lovets. Brother Rodney and Miss Linda were able to be here Sunday, and what a joy that was to get to see them. Uh, but that they would continue to get better. Pray for Brother Neil. He is still recovering, but uh, doing better. And so praise the Lord for that. Grateful to hear. And ask God during this time in your life, whatever you're going through, to help you draw closer to him. Let's pray. Father, as we go through the day-to-day -day of life and the busyness of what takes place, may it be that we not forsake our time with you, but may we draw closer. Father, may we rest in you. May we let you carry the burden. And Lord, may we just simply grow out of the encouragement from your word tonight that in the wilderness, we are your priceless treasure. Lord, we don't deserve that. And Father, even as we lift up requests to you, we know that you care far more than we do. And Father, we lift up the Lovets. We lift up Brother Holstrom. And God, we just trust you to continue to strengthen them. And Lord, we trust you that your way is perfect. And may we look to you for guidance and direction during every moment and trial of life. Help us to make much of you in our days in life. It is because of Christ we ask it. Amen. Thank you so much. Lord bless you. Have a wonderful week.